Hello and welcome to the Algebras. In this lecture, lecture number 16, we will discuss Serre's theorem on classification of semi-simple finite dimensional complex Lie algebras. So let's immediately start with a short version of the theorem. So the theorem, which is due to Serre from 1966, for any root system phi, there is a unique up to isomorphism semi-simple finite dimensional complex Lie algebra whose root system is phi. A little bit later, we will give a more detailed version of the theorem which presents an explicit construction of this Lie algebra. But in order to be able to formulate that extended version, we first have to talk about presentations of Lie algebras. So let's start with free algebras, which are usually called magmas. Assume that k is a field. Recall that an algebra over k is just a k-vector space with a fixed binary bilinear operation. This operation is not assumed to have any further properties. It's not supposed to be associative or commutative or anything else. Definition. Given a, a set x, a magma over x is a pair m of x and phi, where m of x is an algebra over k, and phi is a map from x to m of x, such that the pair m of x and phi satisfies the following universal property. For any k algebra A and any map psi from x to A, there is a unique algebra homomorphism psi from m of x to A, such that the composition of psi and phi equals to psi. As usual, for the objects defined via a universal property, if we can show that a magma over x exists, then it is unique up to isomorphism. And existence of magmas will be proved on the next slide. So let's give an explicit construction. So assume that x is a finite set. For a non-negative integer n, denoted by b and x, the finite set consisting of all ways to compute the non-associative product of n elements in x. Note that the set b and x has cardinality, which can be obtained in the following way. So there are cardinality of x to the power n monomials of lengths n, which one construct from elements in x. And for each such monomial, there are exactly cn ways to put a non-associative bracket on this monomial. Here cn is the nth Catalan number, 1 divided by n plus 1 to n choose n. So for example, the set b3 of x contains all elements of the following form. If we have three elements a, b, and c in x, we can bracket them in two ways. First b and c, and then a, or first a and b, and then c. So this, the set b3 of x will be the set consisting of all bracketing of three elements from x. Now we can define m of x as a k-vector space with the basis given by the disjoint union of all bn of x over all non-negative integers n. On the set m of x, we can define the following bilinear operation, giving two elements alpha in bn of x and beta in bm of x. We define their product as the bracketing of alpha with beta. This will be now an element in b n plus m of x. And then we can extend this operation to the whole of m of x by bilinearity. So we define the map phi from x to m of x by sending an element x in x to the same element, but now considered as an element of b1 of x. And directly from the construction, we see that m of x and phi, that this pair, is a magma over x. Okay, so this was for arbitrary algebras. Now we want to construct a universal object for Lie algebras. So free Lie algebras. For Simplicity, let us denote by double bracket of x, y, and z, the expression of x, y, and, and z, which corresponds to the Jacobi identity, which is used in the definition of a Lie algebra. So we define the free Lie algebra L of x as the quotient of the magma m of x 
modulo the two-sided ideal generated by all the following elements the bracket of x and x for any element x in our basis b the sum of the brackets of x and y and y of x for any pair x and y in our basis b and the double brackets of x y and z for any triple x y and z of elements in b so we denote by v maps to the overlying v the projection from the magma m of x to the freely algebra l of x to justify the name that l of x is a freely algebra first we note that l of x is a lie algebra to prove that l of x is a lie algebra we need to show that the bracket in l of x is anti-commutative and satisfy the Jacobi identity. For anti-commutativity, we know that the bracket of a linear combination of elements in B with itself can be rewritten as a sum of two expressions. The first one is a sum of brackets of elements in B with itself with some coefficients, and the second expression is a sum with some coefficients of brackets of mn plus nm where m and n are different elements in B. Due to the fact that we factor out all brackets of the same element of B with itself and the sum of x, y, and y, x, we deduce that the right-hand side of this equality is equal to zero in the quotient L of x, and hence the operation induced on L of x is anti-commutative. For the Jacobi identity, it's even easier. So if we consider the double bracket of an arbitrary set of linear combinations of basis elements in B, then using the bilinearity of the bracket, we can rewrite this as a sum over all our involved indices of the double brackets of elements in B. So since the double bracket of elements in B is equal to zero in the quotient, we deduce that the left-hand side is also equal to zero in the quotient. So this justifies the name that L of X is a Lie algebra. And from the universal property of magmas, L of X inherits the following universal property, that for any Lie algebra A and any map Xi from X to A, there is a unique homomorphism of Lie algebras, Psi, from L of X to A, such that the composition of Psi with the image of Phi of X under the overlying map is equal to Xi of X. So this follows directly from the definitions and the universal properties of magmas. So now when we have the notion of a free Lie algebra, we can define what a presentation of a Lie algebra is. Given a Lie algebra A, assumes that X is a subset of A, which generates A in the sense that the intersection of all Lie subalgebras of A containing X coincides with A. If we fix such X, we have a unique Lie algebra homomorphism from the free Lie algebra for this set X to A, which is the identity on X. So this homomorphism exists by the universal property of L of X. Since X generates A, the image of this homomorphism is a subalgebra of A containing X and hence coincides with A. In other words, the homomorphism phi is surjective. Now we can fix Y some subset of the free algebra L of X, which generates the kernel of the homomorphism phi as a Lie ideal. So the collection of the set X and the set Y is usually called a presentation of X. So this means that A is isomorphic to the freely algebra of X modulo the ideal generated by Y. For example, if A is in abelian Lie algebra and X is its basis, then it has presentation consisting of X and all possible brackets of elements in X. They all should go to zero in the presentation because the algebra is abelian. So traditionally, instead of just listing elements of Y in the presentation, one writes y is equal to zero, meaning that these elements will be zero in the Lie algebra A. So elements of y are usually called the defining relations in this presentation. And giving a presentation of a Lie algebra is the same thing 
as defining this Lie algebra by generators and defining relations. So now let us discuss a presentation for a semi-simple Lie algebra. So let G be a semi-simple, complex, finite dimensional Lie algebra with a fixed Cartan subalgebra H. Then we have the corresponding root system phi in H star, and we can choose a fixed basis pi of the root system phi. For any positive root alpha, we can fix an SL2 triple F alpha, H alpha, and E alpha, which corresponds to this root alpha. The claim is that the set consisting of all F alpha, H alpha, and E alpha, where now alpha runs through our basis pi, that this set generates G. To prove this, first let us note that we already know that the set of all H alpha, where alpha is in pi, is the basis of the Cartan subalgebra. So we only need to show that X generates all other root spaces. We know the following facts about the root system. First of all, all subspaces G gamma are one dimensional. Then, if beta and gamma are roots, such that beta plus gamma is also a root, then the commutator of G beta and G gamma equals to G beta plus gamma. Finally, we know that any root can be reduced by a sequence of simple reflections, that is reflections with respect to simple roots, to a root alpha in our basis. Combining these three facts together, it follows that any root space G gamma can be obtained from the root spaces G plus minus alpha, where alpha is a simple root, using commutators. Indeed, each simple reflection can be described using the SL2 theory as a successive application of commutators with the corresponding simple root space G plus or minus alpha. So this implies the statement of our proposition that this set X generates G. So now what about the defining relations? We already know several relations which are satisfied by our generating set. First of all, Cartan elements commute because the Cartan subalgebra H is abelian. Furthermore, the commutator of E alpha and F alpha is equal to H alpha for any simple root alpha because F alpha, H alpha and E alpha forms an SL2 triple. Then, the commutator of E alpha and F beta is equal to zero if alpha is different from beta, simply because alpha minus beta is not a root. So if alpha is positive and beta is negative, their sum is not a root, because any root is either positive or negative. Next, the commutator of H alpha with E beta is E beta, up to the scalar which is described by the angle bracket between beta and alpha. This is just the definition of G beta as a common eigenspace for the Cartan subalgebra H. Similarly, the commutator of H alpha with F beta is F beta up to the minus the same scalar, which corresponds to the fact that F beta belongs to G minus beta. So these are the relations which we already knew. So here is a collection of additional relations, which are called SER relations, and are given as follows. Let alpha and beta be two different elements in our basis. Then the claim is that the power, 1 minus the angle bracket of beta and alpha, of the joint action of E alpha applied to E beta is zero. And similarly, if you take the joint operator corresponding to F alpha to the power 1 minus the angle bracket of beta and alpha and apply to F beta, we will get zero. So this is a statement about pairs of roots. So this is a statement which we can check on rank 2 root systems. And the statement which we need to check is that for rank 2 root systems and for any pair alpha and beta of different elements in the root system, the element beta plus alpha with the scalar 1 minus the angle bracket of beta and alpha is not a root. So this can be checked by direct inspection. So for example, in type A2, the angle bracket between different roots in the basis is minus 1. Therefore, we have the expression beta plus 
1 minus minus 1 alpha, which is beta plus 2 alpha, which is certainly not in the root system, because the only roots are alpha beta and alpha plus beta. So in time B2, we have two cases. If alpha is smaller than beta, then the angle bracket of beta and alpha is minus 2, and our expression is beta plus 3 alpha. And in type B2, we have the square, and the root system consists of all vectors going from the middle of the square to the middle of each side of the square and to the vertex. So beta corresponds to the vertex and alpha corresponds to going to the middle of the side. So from the vertex, beta, if we add alpha three times, we go outside of the square. And in the opposite situation where alpha is greater than beta in type B2, then the angle bracket is minus one. And then the expression is beta plus two alpha. But here beta is a vector going to the side of the square and alpha goes to the vertex. When we apply this twice, we go outside of the root system. And similarly, by direct inspection, one can check that the claim is true in type G2. The final root system is the root system of type A1, when the angle bracket is equal to zero, and the cell relation just says that these two elements commute. So now we have checked it for all root systems of rank two, which implies the state. Now we are ready to present the full version of Serre's theorem. Theorem. For a root system phi with basis pi, the Lie algebra G, generated by elements f alpha, h alpha, and e alpha, where alpha is an element of pi, subject to the following relations, different h's commute, the commutator of e alpha and f alpha is equal to h alpha for any alpha, different e alpha and f beta, so for different alpha and beta, commute, the commutator of h alpha with e beta is e beta with a scalar given by the angle bracket of beta and alpha for any pair alpha beta in pi. Similarly, the commutator of h alpha and f beta is f beta with the angle bracket of beta and alpha and the sine minus for any alpha and beta in pi. And then the cell relations that the power one minus the angle bracket of beta and alpha of the adjoint operator of e alpha applied to e beta is zero for different alpha and beta and a similar relation for f's. So the Lie algebra G generated by these elements and subject to these relations is a unique up to isomorphism, semi-simple complex Lie algebra having phi as a root system. So we will not give a full proof of this theorem. It is fairly long, but here is a brief sketch and the reference to the literature. What we actually need to prove, we need to prove that G is a finite dimensional semi-simple Lie algebra and that it has a correct root system phi. The easiest way to do this is first to consider the intermediate Lie algebra, which we define by G tilde, which is given by the same generators and almost the same relations. So we take all the relations in the Serre theorem apart from the last two relations, so apart from Serre's relations. So if we define this algebra G tilde in this way, then this algebra we can define by H the vector space spent by all the H alphas. We denote by N plus tilde the Lie subalgebra spent by all E alphas, and by N minus tilde the Lie subalgebra spent by all F alphas. The key part of the proof is the observation that the algebra G tilde acts on a free tensor algebra in the cardinality of P variables, where the element F alpha acts as multiplication with one of the variables. So the construction of this representation is very explicit, and then the fact that this is a representation, it should be checked by hands, starting from the presentation of G tilde. Using this representation, one can show that G tilde as a Lie algebra is a direct sum of these three vector spaces. They all are subalgebras, but G tilde is not as a direct sum of Lie algebras. So this is just a direct sum of vector spaces, n minus tilde, h, and n plus tilde. So this is very similar to the triangular decomposition of the complex semi-simple Lie algebras, but still we have these tildes which are still in play, and we still didn't do anything about the ser relations. So the next step is to consider the maximal ideal of G tilde, which intersects H 
trivial. So for this ideal, one can show that there is a unique maximal such ideal, and then one can check that the quotient of g tilde by i is a finite dimensional semi-simple Lie algebra with Cartan subalgebra h and root system phi. And finally, one can show that the ideal i is generated by Serre relations. For more details, I refer to the excellent book by Victor Katz, which is called Infinite Dimensional Lie Algebras, where the theorem is proved with all details. Thank you very much. Hope you enjoyed the lecture.